Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to Learn with Lorna 145, looking at the Sage Sutherland collection. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn, I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archives Service, which has four archive centres in the Highlands of Scotland. One in Inverness, one in Fort William, one in Portree and one in Wick. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. And High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland. There's no payment or subscription to take part in this series of talks, but if you're able to donate towards our work, then we really are grateful for that. Uh, this week, as I mentioned last week, is pre-recorded as I am on annual leave. It's very exciting. Um, so I hope that you've been able to find it. Uh, OK, I know sometimes when it's pre-recorded, it's a little bit trickier to find, but also I know that the sound quality tends to be better. So swings and roundabouts. We're continuing this week with April's theme of changes. And I wanted to look at a family this week who were completely immersed in some of the most dramatic periods in Scottish history where things really changed with lasting impact. Most notably, the disruption of 1843 and the Highland Clearances. Looking at the Sage and Sutherland families and deposited collection D1249 held at the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness. Now, these families are very well known to those with an interest in Highland history, particularly with Highland religious history, which is such a huge part, but perhaps not well known to others. And so I wanted to start by, by reading to you the collection administrative history. So whenever we take in a collection and we catalogue it, there we will write an administrative history of who are the people who have been involved in this collection, that what do we know of them, what do we know of the general context of the collection. And so this is the admin history for this collection, and it gives an overview of some of the people who are represented in it, which I'll go on to, to go into more detail about. But just to give you a, a quick uh, way in, Reverend Donald Sage, 1789 to 1869, was an important figure in Highland history, serving as a Church of Scotland and later Free Church Minister in the parish of Rosales, and writing the book Memorabilia Domestica, or Parish Life in the North of Scotland. His father, Reverend Alexander Sage, was Minister of Kildonan Parish, and his grandfather, Aeneas Sage, was preacher in the parishes of Lochcarron, Applecross and Gearloch. Donald Sage married Elizabeth Mackintosh, daughter of Reverend William Mackintosh, Minister of Thurso, and Christina Sutherland, and she, her, and she was the daughter of the Reverend William Sutherland, Minister of Wick. Donald and Elizabeth Sage's youngest daughter, Camilla, uh, Christina Camilla Jane Sage, married the Reverend Donald Sutherland, Minister of Kilmanevig, and their second son, Reverend William Sinclair Sutherland, went to India as a missionary and married Elsie Ruth uh, Nicol, one of the first women graduates of Melbourne University who ran the Red Cross in India during World War II. So th that's just part of the admin history um, that I wanted to share because really it gives you a very quick, and I know it's a lot of names and a lot of dates, but you can very quickly see how central this family is to the religious history of the Highlands. At, at every turn, you come across a minister. Um, so you can see A, why this family is so central to uh, the religious history of the Highlands, but also B, why the collection is called Sage Sutherland, because there are so many connections and interweavings of those families. I wanted to show you this family tree. I've, I know I've done this a few times where I've mentioned family trees, and when I started to do research for this one, I said to Anne, our family historian, do you have a tree for the Sage Sutherland family? Because it would be much easier for me to get my head around who I'm talking about. And she said, oh, I think so. And handed me a family tree of this size. <laughs> a, a substantial tree that she had already done because of the kind of uh, importance of the family. At a very quick count, I think I saw about 35 ministers on it, covering hundreds of years. Now, as always, I only have half an hour, so I will not be able to go into the depth that I would like to. And also, as always, there are many people who are much more expert in this subject than I am, particularly Dr Elizabeth Ritchie of UHI, and then others who are connected, such as Devine Sutherland, who are connected with the Kirk Michael Trust, uh, Cromarty um, Museum and Courthouse, History Links, all sorts of people 
who uh, you can follow up if you want to find out more about this subject. But hopefully this will give you a quick overview and an insight into what we hold about this family. The Saved Sutherland Collection comprises six boxes and it includes uh, legal documents, birth, marriage and death records, um, proof of certificates, as for instance, uh, university diplomas, uh, correspondence, genealogical papers, research papers, diaries, and a substantial collection of photographs. It dates from 1808 to 2005. I'm going to have a look at some of the items that we hold relating to some of the most famous members of this family and uh, hopefully a, a couple that are a little less familiar. So let's start with the Reverend Aeneas Sage, born according to his grandson Donald on the 12th of March 1694 in Killarnan in Rossshire. Born right in the midst of a huge time of change in the established church. After going on to King's College, Aberdeen, he gained his qualification to preach. And he's probably most well known for the time that he spent in Loch Carron, Applecross and Gareloch, particularly Loch Carron. Aeneas Sage was by all accounts both big and strong, which he needed to be. Um, ministers were often mistrusted at this time. It's a time of religious turmoil, a time of division between faiths. And so ministers were not always um, tr as trusted as we would maybe think. Let me share with you an article that appears in our collection entitled A Fighting Minister. For nearly two years, he ruled his flock with a rod of iron and sometimes with a sword. In the statistical account, he is described as a man of undaunted spirit who did not know what the fear of man was, but had the fear of God and a great zeal for the good cause. The cleric's undaunted spirit was displayed on the day following his uh, induction when a mob surrounded and set fire to his house. Supported by a party of friends he was entertaining, Sage rallied forth and laid about him uh, to good purpose with a heavy cudgel. It goes on to say, many stories are told of his somewhat unclerical but original methods. On one occasion, a factor named Campbell considered himself insulted by a remark passed during a sermon and challenged the minister to a duel. Campbell was a notorious coward and named a Sunday morning for the meeting in the hope that Sage would refuse to fight on the Sabbath. He mistook his man. The gallant Aeneas closed his church and made his way to the proposed scene of combat. When Campbell appeared and found his opponent waiting for him with a large broad broadsword, he promptly fled. Duel fighting on Sunday is hardly orthodox conduct for a minister, but as a contemporary said, he struck terror into vice and by expressing the discipline of the church and composing uh, things amongst the people, reduce, reduce them to a state of civilization. One of his most notable exploits took place shortly after his arrival in Loch Carron. A leading member of the congregation had fallen from grace by sharing his house not only with his wife but with his mistress as well. Complaint being made to the injured by the injured wife to Mr Sage, he at once set forth and, finding the Highlander in his stronghold, commanded him to dismiss his lady love without a moment's delay. The husband replied to this by flourishing his dirk and ordering his wife, his wife's champion, out of the house. Thoroughly aroused, Sage threw the sword he always drew the suit, sword he always wore, and after a sharp tussle, disarmed the now repentant sinner. Having him at his mercy, he seized the opportunity to dictate terms to his opponent, and as a result, the mistress was turned out, and peace reigned in another household. So he's a bit of a character. Um, what I absolutely love is that article finishes with what might be my favourite sentence. Opinions differ as to whether Sage's parochial technique was the correct one or not. Just extraordinary. There are other story, uh, stories about Aeneas Sage that are equally uh, dramatic. So, for instance, the time that he was able to avoid a murder attempt by two of his parishioners by squeezing the would-be assassins into headlocks until on the brink of suffocation, they screamed never to harm him. Incidentally, Aeneas's father-in-law, the Reverend John Mackay, Minister of Laird, was known as a Minister Lachtier, Lachtier, I think, a Minister Lachtier, the strong minister, because he would sometimes go into the pulpit with a brace of pistols and taught people to respect his arm as well as his piety. And I think that those really illustrate how 
how dangerous a job it could be to be a minister and how controversial a job. Aeneas Sage married uh, the, the, his wife, uh, Elizabeth Mackay, who was the daughter of that minister I mentioned, with whom he would go on to have about 11 children. And I always say about because I'm never entirely sure that we always know the ones that might have lost their lives young. But he had a number of children, including the man I'm going to talk about next, Alexander Sage. Aeneas died in 1774, having been a minister right through the very dramatic political uh, religious and political conflict of the Jacobite Risings. He was well into his 80s when he died and he left a legacy which remains to this day. He is credited with bringing the gospel to Loch Carron and being much loved by his parishioners and he's buried in Loch Carron. Aeneas can also be credited with being the first to connect the name of Sage to the preaching of the gospel with which it remains so associated. As I mentioned, the next family member I want to talk about is his son, Alexander. Alexander was the sixth son of Aeneas Sage and Elizabeth Mackay, um, all of whom, all of those sons, almost all of them would go on to die young. But Alexander was born on the 2nd of July, 1753 at the Lochcarron Manse. And according to his son, Donald, he was sent to Cromarty to be educated. Really interesting if we look back to the Anne Fraser diary episode of a couple of weeks ago, how Cromarty is seen as a place of education and um, intelligence. Alexander, in turn, would go on to become a minister, like his father, working first as a teacher and then qualifying to preach and serving as a missionary before settling to serve one parish. In his case, it was the parish of Kildonan in Sutherland. Alexander Sage appears to have shared some uh, similarities with his father. Have a listen to this extract from his son Donald's book, Mem Memorabilia Domestica. Um, going back to the episode uh, last week, thank goodness for people writing down their memories. So this is what Alexander's son had to say about him. As a teacher, my father had three distinguishing qualities, assiduity, fidelity, and I must add, severity. The last of these arose from a hasty temper and his own early training. My father's temper was hot, but it was connected with that generosity which makes kind-hearted, hasty men the favourites of those who personally know them. His natural heat of temper, too, was more formidable inasmuch that it was combined with a more than ordinary measure of personal strength. He was six foot one inch in height, with a great breadth of chest and shoulders. To his scholars, therefore, his temper, when ruffled, was no trifle. Let me do him only justice, however, by saying that it was never called forth but by carelessness, disobedience to authority or vice. In short, by any of those things which thoughtless youth are so ready to throw as obstacles in the way of their own progress or improvement. To remove these obstacles, he subjected his pupils to strict discipline, and the heat of temper with which he did so was expressive not of any ill will towards the offenders, but of an anxiety that the ends of discipline should be secured. So basically he was a disciplinarian, but very much for people's own good. Despite that kind of discipline and that, that description of Alexander, just like Aeneas, of being physically big and imposing and, and having a bit of a temper, fa like father, like son, it seems that Alexander was very well loved, both by his pupils when teaching and by his parishioners when he went on to preach, first in Caithness and then in Sutherland. Donald gives a fascinating description in his book of his personality. He says that he had an aberration of sin of any kind, a simplicity of outlook that says that his father was a man of no intellectual force or ability to articulate. And he goes on to say that his mother was the intelligent one. His mother was the one with the communication skills who enabled his father to preach. And we'll see that. We'll come back to that time and time again in this episode. Alexander Sage would marry twice. First, Isabella Fraser, whose father was a notable minister and by whom he had a number of children, including Donald. And second, after Isabella's death in childbirth, he would marry Jean Sutherland. Alexander's sorrow at his mother's, uh, at his wife's loss, his first wife, Isabella, when she died. Donald, the son, recorded this moment in his memories. Now, he was only three at the time that his mother died. 
but this is how he remembered it as an adult. A bed stood in the northeast corner of the room with dark curtains folded up on it. On the bed lay extended with a motionless stillness which both surprised and terrified me, one whom I at once knew to be my mother. I was sure it was she, although she lay so silent and still. She appeared to me to be covered with a white sheet or robe, white leather gloves on her hands, which lay crossed over her body. At the opposite corner of the room sat my father. He had, previous to my coming in, been indulging his grief in silence and giving vent to the bitterness of heart in half-audible sighs. My sudden and heedless entrance seemed to open up the floodgates of his grief. I was the favourite child of her who now lay stretched in death, the last surviving pledge of their affection. It was too much for him. He sobbed aloud, the tears rolled down his face, his frame shook, and he clasped me in his large embrace in all the agony of great sorrow. That sobbing still rings in my ears, although then my only feeling was that of childish wonder. I gazed, now at my mother's body, especially at her gloved and motionless hands, and then at my father, as I could not conceive that any but children could weep at all, or at least weep aloud. My mother died in the forty-second year of her age. Of the subsequent events, the freshness of my father's sorrow, the solemnities of my mother's funeral, the necessary arrangements in the household consequent upon her death, of these, with many other circumstances, I have not the slightest remembrance, but the scene I have just described retains its place like a framed picture in my memory. Really um, beautifully written, I think. Alexander would, as I said, go on to marry again, Jean Sutherland. You'll be surprised to hear her father was not a minister. Um, and that was a marriage that would go on to last until her death in 1819. And again, Donald in his memories describes his stepmother with great affection and the loss, her loss much later with, with great sorrow as well. But again, he describes his stepmother as having a very sharp intelligence. And as I said, all the men in this family seem to have picked wives of huge intelligence and perception and ability who contributed quite substantially to their ministries. And as I say, we'll see that as we go on as well. We hold letters written by Alexander to his son Donald, and a couple of things are clear from them. One, that they remained close. That closeness he describes there when, at the, the mother's uh, deathbed, it's clear that that closeness, closeness remained. And also that they discussed with each other their shared life's work and calling of the ministry. Have a listen to a parts of this letter from 1819 when Donald was 30 and uh, it was the year that the, the second wife uh, died. I was struck by the amount of parental advice that Alexander is giving Donald, even though his son is 30. My dear son, yours of the 21st, I'll received on the 31st inst. So you sent it last month, I've received it this month. Um, Favoured by Andrew Sutherland and your letter before that I received requesting the feather bed. The feather bed was sent to Helmsdale last week to the care of Mr Simpson, who promised he would get it sent to Aberdeen in eight days following, weather serving by sea. In answer to your former, I wrote that I was to send it to Fintorn by the Duke, as I would not then get an opportunity to send it by Helmsdale, by a letter which was forwarded to you by your D. Mackenzie from Ray on his way to attend Aberdeen University. So, just general chit chat about this, transporting this bed around Scotland. He goes on to say, uh, Do not be anxious about my welfare, as thank God I enjoy good health and perform duty. I'm happy you find matters so smoothly in your charge, although you have mental labour. I mentioned my care about your intention of receiving and entertaining boarders on your outset until you acquired more household experience. So he's saying, I said I didn't think it was a good idea for you to get a, a boarder. I am well pleased that you've dropped that plan. Your furniture no doubt would pinch your finances not a little, but you will not lose your money finally. Your nurse, RC, a famous intelligence, told me that she was informed that Mrs Sutherland, your step-aunt, was to manage, manage house for you and come to town during the winter. But I would not consider that credible, for although she is a sensible, experienced woman, her extravagant table would be too much for herself and for you. You're going to Dundee, most probably by the mail coach. That is the most economical and expeditious. And I suppose that Mr MacLeod will defray your expenses. So all of that, you know, I've, I said to you not to take borders in. That's a bad idea. But, you know, you're a grown man. You can do what you like. But I'm glad you've dropped that plan. And then 
uh, you're, you're going. I hope you're going that way because that is the cheapest way. So don't don't go any other way. Um, just really interesting. He goes on to say, um, to, as to the poor, their fate in future as to removals are determined. We'll come back to the removals, the pleadances. Clunis has taken, uh, has at length taken what remained of the strath, and the vile man has gone on in his lecherous course to debauch his faithful shepherd's daughter, his lamb ewe. I shall cite before the presbytery for his act, repeated acts of uncleanness. So, discussing around discipline in the parish. It's very strange to hear that I should be proposed to be Minister of Golfsby in my time of life. It would be the last charge that I should incline to have were I younger than I am. He finishes the letter, so there are various other extracts in it, but he finishes it by saying, recommending to the care and guidance of your Lord and Saviour, I continue to be my dear Donald, your affectionate father. So again, that softness of relationship. Alexander died in 1824. Like his father Aeneas, he left his stamp on the history of the Highlands and left a gap, of course, in his family. And we come next to his son Donald, the writer of Memorabilia Domestica and probably the most famous name of the family today. Donald was born on the 20th of October 1789 at the manse at Kildonan. And his memoir is full of stories of his grandparents, his parents, all sorts of local people and um, other ministers and people he encountered, stories of his childhood and education in Dornoch and Aberdeen and Edinburgh. I will absolutely not have time to go into it, so I'm not going to start, but I really would encourage you to look it up because it is such a great source of information about the Highlands. It's in full online. If you search um, Memorabilia Domestica Donald Sage, you'll be able to find the whole book online or you can read some of the articles discussing it on the History Links website. He would go on, Donald would go on to follow in the family profession, becoming first a teacher and then a minister. And of course, I think we forget sometimes how closely linked those two professions were. Prior to the Education Act of 1872, the church is so heavily involved with education. His ministry was profound and he remains, as I said, a much uh, loved and well-known figure today, having served in various places from Aberdeen to Rosales. He married first Harriet Gordon Robertson and his memorabilia domestica is just so beautiful about his description of their love and then her, her death following less than a year of marriage. She died in childbirth and his complete kind of prostration of grief. But after her death, he went on to marry again Elizabeth Mackintosh, a minister's daughter, by whom he would have 10 children, including ministers. I'll come back to some of those children and descendants. But first of all, I want to focus on two particular episodes in Donald Sage's life when he was witness to momentous change in Scottish history, both of which have ramifications today. In Memorabilia Domestica, Donald recalls the impact of the clearances on the parish of Kildonan in Sutherland, where he grew up. He describes the first clearance as the ejection from their minutely divided farms of several hundreds of the Sutherlandshire Aborigines, who had from time immemorial been in possession of their mountain tenements. He said that this sweeping desolation extended over many parishes, but fell most heavily on Kildonan. Donald Sage's book gives extraordinary, moving, first-hand detail of the waves of clearance, the depopulation, the oppression, the tumult and the change from a landscape teeming with people to one that became empty. But it's his account of the 1819 clearance which is perhaps the most moving and it includes this description of his last sermon there. In Strathnaver we assembled for the last time at the place of Langdale, where I had frequently preached before, on a romantic green sward overhung by Robert Gordon's antique romantic little cottage on an eminence close beside us. The still flowing waters of the Naver swept past us a few yards to the eastward. The Sabbath morning was unusually fine, and mountain, hill and dale, water and woodland, among which we had so long dwelt, and with which all our associations of home and native land were so fondly linked, appeared to unite their attractions to bid us farewell. My preparations for the pulpit had always cost me much anxiety, but in view of this sore scene of parting, 
They caused me pain almost beyond endurance. I selected a text which had a pointed reference to the peculiarity of our circumstances, but my difficulty was how to restrain my feelings till I should illustrate and enforce the great truths which it involved with reference to eternity. The service began. The very aspect of the congregation was itself a sermon, and a most impressive one. Old Achul sat right opposite me, as my eye fell upon his venerable countenance, bearing the impress of eighty-seven winters, I was deeply affected, and I could scarcely articulate the psalm. I preached, and the people listened, but every sentence uttered and heard was in opposition to the tide of our natural feelings, which, setting in against us, mounted at every step of our progress higher and higher. At last all restraints were compelled to give way. The preacher ceased to speak, the people to listen. All lifted their voices and wept, mingling their tears together. It was indeed the place of parting, and the hour. The greater number parted, never again to behold each other in the land of the living. It's an extraordinary description. And it goes on to describe the, the detail of the credence in, in, um, in, in great detail, an eyewitness account. The second thing I wanted to touch on was the reason that I chose this collection as part of the changes theme this month. Donald Sage was central to the disruption in the Highlands, the break in the established Church of Scotland, which led to the creation of the Free Church, caused by many things, but caused in, in large part by the desire to lessen the control of the heritors, the landowners on the church. So the fact that the landowners had this ability to decide which minister went where, had that control over the church, was one of the main reasons that the Free Church broke away. There's a, a Learn with Lorna on the disruption and the Free Church, so I'd encourage you to have a look at that if you want to learn more about it. In 1843, which was the year of the disruption, Donald Sage was in Rosales on the Black Isle. He was the minister of Kirk Michael and Cullacudden. And he had been there for around 20 years by this point, serving as Church of Scotland minister. And there are more, uh, there's more about his years there on the Kirk Michael Trust website. And again, memories of those years are recorded in Memorabilia Domestica, and I'm not going to go into them. But in 1843, Donald Sage was one of those ministers. There were some 470 out of 1,195 who walked out of the Church of Scotland to form the Free Church taking with him his congregation and therefore losing the building that he had to preach in. Reverend John Mackenzie was appointed to take Donald Sage's place, but in our Church of Scotland Presbytery minutes that we hold, it's recorded that the induction of Reverend Mackenzie couldn't go ahead because a mob of around 80 to 100 people armed with sticks and stones wouldn't allow him access to the church. And this became known as the Rosales Riot and it followed riots in other areas. And one of those involved was Margaret Cameron, the, the rioter at Rosales, who was arrested and taken to Cromarty Prison while around 200 troops were ordered to Rossshire. We can go into the Ross and Cromarty, uh, County of Ross and Cromarty prison book to find out that she wasn't held for long because she was burst out of the prison by a group of people. And I just think this episode is so striking because it shows that, well, the fact that it, this Rosales riot isn't the only one, it shows the strength of feeling about the established church, the, the anger at the situation, the passion for the new free church. And you can see why it's the free church, because they've removed themselves from control. The loyalty to Donald Sage, who said that, the fact that both the church and the state need reform then and now is undeniable. And he wrote with huge passion about his beloved and noble minded free church. He finished his um, memorabilia domestica with a comment about that, about the decision and um, what it had meant to him to join the free church. And he would spend the remaining 26 years of his life serving as a free church minister in Rosales, but also we hold letters from him to his wife describing preaching tours from the 1840s, those early fired up days of the Free Church where he travelled to, um, to gain support and add to the congregations of the Free Church. And those letters really conjure up that fire and passion of the time, but also the challenges faced by those 
who wanted to break free from the patronage of the landowners. Such a huge, brave thing to do. It left them with no church buildings, it left them with limited finances, because of course their stipends were, were connected to the landowners. So a huge decision uh, following a conviction of faith. These are some extracts from August and September 1846 that Donald wrote to his wife back uh, at home while he was on a preaching tour of Skye. I preached here yesterday in the forenoon at the Free Church of Snizert and in the evening here. The labour was too much for me. I had not tasted a morsel of food from nine o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night and had to walk at least four miles back and four of the distance between this and Skabost where Mr MacLeod resides. It's about the same distance from Portree that Cromarty is from the village. I have resolved to take a trip from this to Broadford, distant about 24 miles by the steamboats. I think I'll set out tomorrow. A sister of Mr MacLeod of Snizort resides in the same lodgings with me here. She is a Mrs Finlayson and is the widow of the late Free Church Minister of Brackadale, who died a few years ago in consequence of a fall from his gig. His death was most affecting and his poor wife was so affected by it that she was in an ace of losing her religion. She has now, however, completely recovered her spirits again. She's very kind and attentive to me and is very clever and talkative and well informed. The present state of Skye in regard to religion is very low. The prospects of spiritual prosperity are dark and gloomy. The proprietor and his factor, every one of whom run their carriage in a pair of horses, are the bitter enemies of the truth. And they have made some terrible examples of some of the poor crofters for their adherence to the free church, the consequence of which is that the great majority of the people are terrified into an almost perfect apathy about the cause of truth among them. The great majority among them are rude, careless, sordid set of people who care nothing for nothing but their backs and their bellies. They have no word here about a site for a church and every word I say to them about it turns, they turn a deaf ear to. So that challenge of trying to find a place for people to meet people who are feeling intimidated. A letter a month later says, I wrote to you immediately on receipt of your last and gave you an account, I think, of the Snizort sacrament. I have since then been at Kilmura and Stenshaw. I preached at the latter place on Sabbath last to 4,000 persons assembled on a beautiful terraced bank next to a burn. I baptised nearly 12 persons after the sermon, raising ranging from six months to 13 years. On Monday, I preached at Kilmuir to about 1,800 persons and baptised eight or nine. Really um, evocative and those, those images of the Free Church having to meet outside because they're not allowed into the church buildings. Donald Sage would die in 1869 and we hold copies of the extracts written in the Presbytery Minute Books and sent to his family as a, a memorial to him as well as other items documenting his life. He was buried in Rosales and his grave has the words descended from a race distinguished for godliness and ability. There are so many other family members that I could speak about. There's so much in the collection. There are those who held high ranking political jobs in India. There are others who served as missionaries. There are, of course, other ministers. One of my favourite items, a letter from Huguette for Haig in the French Resistance, which I have referenced before, but it's just a fantastic letter. Um, I could have spoken about Donald's son, who was also a minister and who was the one who published Memorabilia Domestica after his father's day. But I wanted to finish instead by just telling you about two other members of the family. Donald Sage's daughter, Christina Camilla Jane Sage, and her husband, Donald Sutherland, minister of Kilmanivig. Uh, Christina was born on the, in September 1846. And it's interesting that in that last letter I read where Donald's writing to his wife, he went on to say that he's grateful that Elizabeth had her mother and sister with her. And when I thought of that, I thought, of course, because she would be approaching the childbirth of this baby at the time. Incidentally, that letter also says, please write to me, please write to me. So it's all the seriousness of the church. But he then says, even if you just write about what the cats are doing and what they're playing at, that will be fine. Just please write something to me. Um, so Christina was born in September 1846, uh, and she seems to have been, again, a very fascinating woman. And you see their references to the servants that they've picked being very clever and intelligent references in that last letter to the woman he's speaking to being very well informed and intelligent. 
And this daughter, Christina, seems to have followed that pattern. We hold some of her diaries from the 1860s and they are exquisitely written. And again, like Anne Fraser's, I haven't had the time to read them from cover to cover, but I am now determined to. She would have been about 21 at the time that she wrote these diaries and she describes in them her agony as she watches her five-year-old nephew, Alec, die of tuberculosis, followed one month later by the death of her 14-year-old, 14-month-old uh, niece, Bessie. The description of those deaths are incredibly poignant. I felt after the Anne Fraser episode, I probably wouldn't describe another drawn out uh, experience of death. But I do think that it really goes to show us that that image that people sometimes have of death counting less in the past and people not really minding about losing children because so many children died is just nonsense. Her description is detailed and extraordinary. And I want to share just a few sentences of her thoughts with you because I think they show that devastation, but also they show that guiding principle of the family, this faith, this absolute unblinding faith. She says, I felt bewildered, stupefied. I could think on nothing. I felt as though I should like to die too. That verse then came into my mind. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, shall, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. There was the victory over death. I felt calmed, comforted. I could now pray, which I could not do before, and bless God for giving us mercy in our affliction. Yes, I felt strengthened. I could think of Alec as gone a little while before to inherit the mansions prepared for him. He may not come to us, but we can go to him. He's not dead, but sleepeth. A few short years of evil past, we will reach that happy shore where death divided friends at last shall meet to part no more. December the 13th, another trying day, our dear Alex funeral day. When I looked at him for the last time again, I felt that hard stony feeling. Oh, I thought it was cruel to take him away and to bury him in the cold, dark earth. And yet when I looked, I saw that it was only the clay. It was not Alec. He was safe in the bosom of his saviour. And I felt that it was actually a loving father that had plucked this bud that it might bloom in a fairer clime. Quite exquisite. That very human reaction to the loss, but then that rooted strong faith which has sustained generations of her family still sustaining her. After Bessie dies too, the niece, she writes, I am weary of loving what passes away. The sweetest, the dearest, alas, may not stay. I long for that land where partings are over and death and the tomb divides hearts no more. Christina would go on to marry Donald Sutherland, minister, free church minister at Kilmanuvig in 1872. She must have got over her fear of blushing, which she describes with great humour in her diary about the fact that she's not in love with people, but she just goes bright red and there's nothing she can do about it. And then people assume she's in love and she can't stop blushing and she's Surely no one else suffers with this as much as I do. They, uh, Christina and Donald, as with all the couples that preceded them, seem to have operated very, very much as a strong supportive unit in serving their congregation. We hold papers relating to both Donald and Christina, including some cracking photographs. I'm going to put some up. Uh, you should be able to see them if you look back because I'm doing this ahead of time. I'll put them on the Facebook page. Uh, there are a huge number of photos in this collection. There's a long obituary for Christina, which describes her as a worthy daughter of her noble line of ancestry, commenting on her faithful and devoted work to her parishioners, her striking personality, her strong religious conviction, her warm heart, her conversational powers and her great intellectual ability. Again, she ran the Sabbath school for young men and women. She ran temperance organisations. She took on much of the pastoral care for her husband and made the Free Church Manse a place where a warm Highland welcome awaited all who crossed its threshold. And it says to the end she lived a full and rich Christian life. She is buried in Tomnahurik Cemetery in Inverness and her memorial service was conducted by a Reverend Mackay who was her nephew of course. She and Donald were survived by a number of children, including William Sinclair Sutherland, who was a minister and a missionary who went to India, where he became director of a leprosy settlement 
and married Elsie Ruth Nicholl, who was one of the first women graduates of Melbourne University and who ran the Red Cross in India in World War II. So a family of extraordinary men and a family of extraordinary women who have left a huge mark on the history of the Highlands and I've only talked about a handful of them. Please do have a look at uh, Memorabilia Domestica, have a look at History Links, have a look at the Kirk Michael Trust. You'll find more information about these extraordinary figures. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you've enjoyed this story. I hope you've been able to find this episode easily. And I hope you can join me next week where I'll be looking at an episode called Fight for Your Right, where I'm pulling things to do with people trying to stand up for their rights. A reminder that the series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. High Life Island's a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, we're very grateful. Thank you.